Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for uh, this event, Changing Seats. This is a listening session organized by and for Black and Indigenous students and for students of color to voice their stories and experiences. And it's also an invitation to us and to teachers to listen and to join in efforts toward racial justice and um, efforts toward building more equitable school communities. Um, but first, before we go any further, I want to pause and acknowledge that those of us who are joining from Whitefish Bay and Milwaukee areas, we are on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homeland. We're along the southwest shores of Michigami, North America's largest system of freshwater lakes. And this is where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinnick rivers meet and where the people of Wisconsin's sovereign Anishinaabek, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations are present. And we name this because we acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal of indigenous people from their homelands. And we also recognize the enslaved Africans who were subjugated to forced free labor to build white wealth and the dehumanization and harm inflicted upon people of color. So thank you again for being here. My name is Sarah Gattel, my pronouns are she, her, and I have the pleasure of co-moderating tonight alongside my colleague Fabi here, who you will meet shortly. Um, and along with several of the students you'll hear from tonight, we are leadership members of Bay Bridge which is a volunteer organization right here in Whitefish Bay, working to promote racial justice and unity in our community and beyond. And this work is informed by and led with young people because we believe they should be in the work and at the tables where decisions affecting their lives are made. So part of this is supporting young people to hone their leadership toward racial justice. And we work to amplify their voices and efforts like in this space. Uh, so one of the things that we talked about with students pretty early on was uh, we were asking, like, what is the most important thing for you in addressing systemic and interpersonal racism? And one of the top things they named was that they really, really wanted to hold a space where they could share their experiences, especially directly to you all, to, to teachers. Um, and having teachers present as active listeners and learners in order to unpack some of the issues they face in schools and in classrooms. So this is that space, um, recognizing this is a beginning point, um, but we're really excited that, that you're here and helping the students to meet that goal. Um, thank you students for your willingness to share your stories and perspectives. It takes a lot of courage and we want this to be um, a space where it feels safe and where you feel supported to share. Um, recognizing that sharing is also always by invitation. So you decide if and what you wanna share. And again, thank you teachers for being here and for your willingness to listen and learn from students as the experts of their experiences. It means a lot that you're here and we hope you'll continue on this path with us. Um, so our agenda here, Boom. Uh, this is where we are. We're at the welcome. Um, next, Fabi is going to share some community agreements to support us in this space. Um, then we'll have time for our student panelists to answer some questions and share their experiences. Um, so these are students who have prepared, who um, have been uh, involved with Bay Bridge and supportive in the space. We also wanna open it up afterward. If and there are other students present here who wanna share their experiences, that will be uh, what comes after the student panel. And then finally, we'll, we're gonna have some time to take questions from teachers. Um, so any questions that you all teachers have for students, um, student panelists are willing to speak to them as much as they can. If you do have questions along the way, please put them in the chat and that is what we will use as a reference point to pull those questions. So 
all questions into the chat. And then we'll, we'll have a closing and share some resources as well. Okay, so, um, oh, I also wanted to mention, um, you may notice the little blink and red light at the top, we are recording. Um, this is for people who weren't able to attend that really wanted to and requested it. Um, this recording is only for the student panelist portion as they have expressed consent. Um, so no other student statements will be shared in the recording, but just wanted to give you all a heads up on that. So that is enough for me. I'm going to turn it over to my co-moderator, Fabi, to take us through the community agreements. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate every single one of you that took the time to join us in this very important panel discussion. So for this event, we want to center, center BIPOC student voices and we honor that this is a forum for Black, Indigenous and students of color to share their experiences and perspectives with teachers as listeners. We want you guys to respect the rights of others to share their experiences and to hold opinions or beliefs that differ from yours. Um, we also want you to be present and engaged and to set aside distractions and just bring all of yourself to this moment. Uh, we also want you to listen deeply and to listen intently um, to what is said and the feeling that is beneath these words. Uh, speak from your own experience. Um, this is for anyone who's talking um, tonight. Um, use I statements when sharing. Do not name specific people in your story unless you have their consent. Um, we want to have grace and to recognize that we are all still learning. Um, we are willing to change. Um, uh, be willing to change your perspective and make space for others to do the same. And learning is uncomfortable, but we want you to lean in. Um, sanctuary is the next one, which we want to create a safe space for sharing and to keep personal stories that people share confidential. Um, and finally, we want to embrace this as a process. Uh, we won't be finished after this and ending racial justice requires ongoing attention and care and it cannot be rushed with quick solutions. And we are always um, guided by and offer contributions that are rooted in and come from our desire to improve our schools and community. Thank you so much, Fabi. So could we get some nods, some thumbs up, any agreement in the chat, just confirming like these are feeling good, we're, we're in this together. Thank you, I'm getting some of those, appreciate you. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to do a little screen shuffle, uh, the joys of virtual spaces. Um, but okay, now we're going to be moving into um, our student panel and hearing from our student panelists. So again, teachers, if you have any questions that come up during this time, please feel free to put them in the chat and then we'll have some time for that at the end. Um, but let's start off with some introductions. Um, so, Fabi, since you just spoke, I'm going to hand it over to you first for an introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm Fabi Lyons. I am a junior. I just recently uh, transferred over to Whitefish Bay. I spent two years of uh, my high school career so far at DSHA, and um, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Thanks, Bobby. Asia, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, hi, I'm Asia. I'm a junior as well at Whitefish Bay, and I'm also really excited to be here. And I thank everybody that came here to listen to everything that we have to say. Thank you, Asia and Bailey. Hi, everybody. I'm Bailey. I'm a senior at Whitefish Bay High School. And so I actually heard from Bay Bridge about from Asia um, through our school's Black Student Union, which kind of has the same goals, but it's just a school led club. So I'm really excited to have this kind of open dialogue today. And I'm really thankful to everybody who clicked the link and took the time out of their day outside of the school day to come and join this. Wonderful. 
Okay, so let's open up the conversation. Um, and I'll ask the first question and then any of you can chime in when you're ready. Um, so first of all, why do you think racial equity is important to discuss in your community? So I'll start. So um, we definitely have seen over the summer that uh, there were protests over the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others. And my eyes were just really open to the systemic racism that exists in this country. And George Floyd's death was horrifying. And it's uh, disheartening to know that there are a lot of people in this country who try to justify it. And um, it's also even scarier to know that half of the country condones racism and there is a lot of hate from white individuals um, and they perpetuate the racism that continues to damage people of color. And the Black Lives Matter protests aren't just about police brutality. It is a movement that calls for institutions, including schools to reflect on themselves and to identify those policies that contribute to the systemic racism and then to do the work um, of reforming them. And to begin addressing racial equity, we have to break down specific groups of people who have to change in the school and the students, the parents and the administration. And we have to start small. And if that starts with our own school, that's great. And we can work towards bettering our own communities. Thank you, Fabi. Bailey or Asia, would you like to, to share as well? I think specifically in this community, a lot of times issues like this can fall on deaf ears because especially in the North Shore, Whitefish Vale, the surrounding areas, a lot of people of color are the minority. So if it's not something you experience, you're not necessarily going to address it. It's not going to be your first instinct. So I think it's very important to have conversations about it in a educational way, because I think most of the time racial incidents that happen aren't necessarily intentional. They're more fueled by ignorance. And so education can help to combat a lot of the issues that happen. And education can even help to kind of combat the overt racist incidents that happen, because when you have hatred, it's oftentimes aligned with ignorance. Yeah, and to also add what Bay was saying, you know, within the Whitefish Bay community, this is something that is not talked about, or if it's talked about, it's kind of little small conversations, but they're not getting anywhere. And like with us having this meeting, this is a perfect way for people to go out and just spread the word about different things. And, yeah. thank okay, thank you all so much um, for emphasizing that, um, those important reasons uh, for why we need to talk about racial equity. Um, Bailey, I appreciate your point, especially about how hatred and racism is often fueled by ignorance. Um, that's a really important reminder for us. So the next question is, um, if you could share a little bit more from your own experiences, what are some of the experiences you've had or have observed at school um, related to these issues? And this can be positive, could be negative, could be a mix, whatever you wanna share. So I unfortunate, unfortunately have dealt with a lot of negative experiences. Um, and given the fact that I live in Whitefish Bay and I actually um, went to DSHA to kind of escape the um, harassment I dealt with at uh, Whitefish Bay. And it's it was really, I guess, tough to find out that a lot of the racial incidents that I dealt with um, happened at DSHA too. And um, it happened more with faculty um, members. And so I'll just like give a little bit of 
some stories of what I dealt with. So consist consistently, my name is pronounced wrong and people pronounce it like they would pronounce Abby, but with an F and it's embarrassing and I have to correct teachers all the time. And, um, and, and in many cases they become defensive about it. Um, and it's also, it's also typically the first interaction with people who are essentially telling me that I'm not important. Um, enough for them to bother to know how to say my name. And I wish teachers would simply ask, how do I pronounce your name? It's really that easy. Um, there was an incident at DSHA um, where the classroom was clearly segregated. Chairs were set up on opposite ends of the room and all the black and Latina girls were on one side and they were on the other side, there were all white girls. And none of the other white girls wanted to come over to our side when it came to working with partners. Um, it's not possible that the teacher in this case didn't see what we saw, um, and this setup shouldn't be allowed in classrooms. Um, another situation was I was born in Loja, Ecuador, and there was an incident with where a faculty member um, from DSHA spelled my home country wrong, and I tried correcting her, but she brushed it off with a whatever, um, and as if it was such an inconvenience to her. And these little things are microaggressions and are real and frequent. Um, and where I was born is important to me and it's important to everyone as part of their own personal story. Another incident was when I had to reschedule an exam and I went um, to the person who reschedules the exams and without even letting me explain my situation, she said, you ride the bus, right? And she saw a Latina face and um, made her assumption that all Latinas come from the same place in Milwaukee. Um, I have experienced major backlash and harassment from white boys in Whitefish Bay, including threats and harassment in the hallways because I spoke out on misconduct that was happening in classrooms. And I have been in many situations where I've been verbally abused in classrooms and every single white kid in the classroom would stay silent. And even the adults in the room, a white woman just watched it all go down. And feeling unsafe and totally alone is not a great feeling. And if only one teacher would have shut down the harassment, maybe my life would be better in Whitefish Bay. There was another incident where a kid told me I could never be liked because I was brown. I considered this person a friend at that time, but I believed what this student said, and it has been a message that I internalized and could never get over. I consistently watch my black peers get skipped over on roll call. I've seen many white girls make fun of black students as um, they speak out in class. Um, and the main issue is that we are not believed. Um, I've experienced offensive language from a teacher in a classroom and my, my parents brought it to the attention to, this, to the school. Um, their first reaction was, we know that teacher, that person couldn't possibly have said that. Starting the conversation with, um, it's not possible, immediately negates my experience. And um, we want you to believe us and we are not seeking any trouble. We're not gonna gain anything from telling on a teacher. And we are not trying to trap teachers and ruin their lives in any way. We are just trying to be heard and to be believed and to be respected and valued. Um, well, to add like an experience I had, so prior to coming to Whitefish Bay, I actually went to a Milwaukee public school and the education there, like a Milwaukee school and like here at Whitefish Bay, the education is very different. And so I came to Whitefish Bay my sixth grade year. And um, there was a teacher there who we kind of didn't get along very well because I would constantly ask questions in class because like, I was really confused on what was going on or like the way she was explaining it due to me going to Milwaukee school. And one day after school, she told me that, basically like just to sum it up, she told me that I wasn't enough and that I wouldn't be able to go to college and if I can't make a grade in her class, I kind of would just be only working a nine to five and wouldn't, be anything in life and ever since she said that like it 
it really affected me because when you're a sixth grader, what do you know to do? Like when someone touches you, that, you just kind of just assume it's right. And like all through middle school and like my freshman year, I kind of always felt like, well, I could I couldn't be anything in life. I just wasn't nothing. I was kind of useless. So like school wasn't really like of importance to me. And like my grades showed in it. And um, even like some of my counselors like in middle school, she noticed, but like I kind of didn't say anything because walking into Whitefish Bay, I only saw good things about it because when I went to like the little walk around of the school, they only said positive things about Whitefish Bay. They never really talked about certain negative things that, you know, happened, which I do understand, like no school wants to talk about it, but I mean, not all schools are perfect and here like I feel like as if teachers they kind of don't talk about the negative things in Whitefish Bay which are kind of important because if you want students to come here you kind of have to let them know things that they kind of have to be aware of because it, it was hard for me to adapt to like being in Whitefish Bay it took a long time like I'll probably say maybe the end of my freshman year, I kind of adapt to having people, teachers that look different than me and being around students that look different than me compared to my other school. But like that situation, like it still affects me, but like I kind of turned the situation around and looked at it as like, you know, she's wrong and that I can go to college and for myself. Um, so for me at the high school, I want to start off by saying I've had so many good experiences with so many teachers. I mean, having teachers that are really willing to accept constructive criticism has been something that's been very helpful in my journey at Whitefish Bay, but it, it definitely was hard. I mean, I've gone to Whitefish Bay since, you know, my whole life, but I live in Milwaukee, so I'd take the bus. And it's just like little things that I would miss out on just from like being on the bus. Like it, it's something that like changes your view of high school. Like you can't do certain activities that take place before school because you have to take the bus and therefore you can't participate. So you're not part of a certain culture of like the middle school or the high school or whatever. And it also ties into what Bobby was saying about microaggressions. So for me an experience in seventh grade that was the first time I ever heard a white person say the N-word. And that was what I knew racism to be. Somebody saying a slur to you and it's meant to be offensive. And I got to high school and I would notice certain microaggressions, but I didn't know what to label it as because it, it wasn't necessarily overtly racist. It was more covert and it was more something, the certain way somebody talks to you or the certain word choice a teacher uses or the certain word choice a student uses. So it, and I didn't even know what a microaggression was. So it definitely shaped my opinion. I, a lot of the times, a lot of the students of color at Whitefish Bay like to stick together for that reason, because you often will feel judged and it might not even be intentional. And so I felt in a lot of ways, you kind of have to advocate for yourself. And sometimes that would not be a problem for me because like, I'm like, really outgoing and stuff, but sometimes it gets tiring kind of always feeling like you have to be the one to educate somebody else on ignorance and things because it does seem like common sense when it is your experience. So whether it be something that's covert or overt, I think they are equally as important and they are something that definitely like shapes your experience at school. And if you can't have a safe space to learn, then you're not gonna perform like the best that you can. Thank you, Bailey, and thank you all again for sharing your stories. That, that's really painful, um, and I'm, I'm seeing the faces of our attendees as well and, and feeling that shared sense of grief um, for what you've experienced. Um, no one should have to experience microaggressions or overt racism or othering or any of these things, especially not our young people. 
Um, and certainly should never experience feelings or being told that you're not enough. Um, you are so beyond enough. Um, so thank you all for sharing. Um, so given your experiences and um, what, you, what you've seen around you as well, what would you like to see change at your school? What would change look like for you? I would definitely say that I'd like to see more diversity. So diversity in thought, diversity in the opportunities we all have, just being able to feel like it's just a very non-uniform place. I would like to feel like I can express a feeling that someone else might not understand, but they can definitely sympathize with. Um, and I definitely like to see more things implemented into the curriculum that focus on that. Um, not just something, you know, an advisory that's like a racial awareness video. Like I actually want like people to be brought in to talk to us. You, I mean, you don't see a lot of, of black role models, black teachers, people of color role models in general. Like it's so disappointing how little representation there is. And that's really important. Hypothetically, if I wanted to become a teacher, I would have only met maybe one or two black teachers in my entire life. And so that's really not okay. And the education part is important, but we also need to implement it into our daily lives. So it doesn't just feel like something that is like a lesson at school that it's just natural to you. Yeah, I definitely like with trying to get people to attend this event, there's a lot of reluctancy from both white students and white teachers. And for example, I'm gonna call out a teacher, Miss um, Wissing, she's absolutely amazing. And she has been so open to these conversations. And I just wish there would be more teachers like her. And um, she, uh, and there's uh, plenty of other students who I can call out for being just amazing and so open to this conversation because I get it, it's really, really uncomfortable to be put on the spot and being, being told that, hey, you're doing this wrong, this wrong, and this wrong. And, um, but we, we want it to make it comfortable for both sides because we acknowledge that there's um, discomfort on both sides. Um, and just, uh, there was another teacher um, from DSHA where um, they uh, specifically like in the beginning of the class said that this is a safe space and um, that he will not condone racism and that he's a person that will um, will uh, be a person that you can come to uh, when an incident happens um, and I don't see that with any other teachers they just they don't acknowledge that there's a potential for um, racist incidents in their own classrooms. And it makes it very hard for, especially as BIPOC students to like look up to a white teacher and feel comfortable coming to them with these incidents. Um, so definitely, I think at the bottom of it all, we just want um, our white counterparts to be more open-minded to these conversations and more open-minded to um, learning and hearing our stories. Thank you, Bailey. Thank you, Fabi. Asia, would you like to add anything? Uh, I was kind of going to just like back with Fabi and Bailey said, kind of just like the teachers being open to certain discussions or like, you know, being open to us coming to them and like, you know, making us feel welcome for us to like tell them how we're feeling because there are certain times, you know, I don't want to just go to certain teachers. I feel like I should be able to speak to all of my teachers about how I'm feeling about certain different things. So just being more open-minded, kind of like what Fabi was saying. I want to add on to that. That's kind of another issue. But there's just a lack of diversity in, this, in the staff. And uh, given the fact that um, Asia and Bailey, um, when they have incidents that happen, they are always re redirected to um, the only Black teacher at Whitefish Bay, and that's also an issue. Yeah, and just to kind of add what Fabi was saying, you know, when teachers kind of send us to the, you know, Fabi was saying, 
Um, well, I'm not the only black male teacher. There's another teacher, but before the other teacher came, they would constantly send us to this staff member. And like, I kind of feel like it shouldn't just be his job to just listen to us. It kind of should be all of the teacher's job to listen to kind of how we feel and not just be like, oh, just go to him because what would we do if he wasn't there? Like, how would we be able to speak out on certain things? Yeah, thank you. And I, I think you're answering what I would guess a lot of people are wondering in this space is how they can be showing up as stronger supports as teachers for you all. Um, and you named some things. Is, is there anything else you would say um, what you need from teachers? What would you ask of teachers? Um, or other examples about experiences you've had with teachers and how you might have wanted it to go differently? Um, any feedback for them I think could be helpful. It's a little tricky because with certain incidents, just like being a student, you're not gonna know like the outcome that happens because it's just like, you can't tell them it's like not your business. But I definitely would like to see more things addressed because like, for example, when a video and picture went around of like white students saying the N word, like I never got a follow up about that. And I was just, it kind of makes it seem like nothing happened and I'm sure something happened but like, I would like something to be done to like set a precedent or like some, like there could be an email sent out, like something to make it known that like, that's not okay. Because it kind of makes it just seem like it's a slap on the wrist. And I understand maybe you can't like expel them or something, but then it kind of puts it in the student's hands to deal with that. And that's where problems occur because that can cause violence that can incite, you know, division within our school between like races which is just a terrible thing that would happen so yeah uh it's pretty simple we just want you to stand up for us and to believe us when we come to you with incidents um and even like i had to meet with a teacher to talk about something um racially um racially wrong um, um, towards immigrants. And he, we had to come to a space on Zoom and talk it out. And just his um, demeanor about it was defensive. And it was, um, it, it, he, it seemed like he just didn't want to acknowledge that he did something wrong. And I get it that like a lot of our experiences is something uh, as a white person, you'll never experience, but you just have to not become defensive when it comes to our personal stories because things you say are going, um, you might not view as offensive, but to us it's offensive. And just continuing to learn um, those offenses and trying to um, avoid them. Well, uh, to add what Bailey was saying, I kind of feel like certain situations we bring to either teachers or like the higher up staff, it's kind of like, okay, we'll get to it on our time which I, okay, they are kind of busy, but when you have students coming up to you about a situation that is serious, that should be like something that should be kind of the most important thing because of the fact, you know, like they were saying, it could cause violence and things like that, which we wouldn't want to happen. And a lot of the teachers there are like higher up staff, they're all about, you know, welcoming and how are you gonna, allow someone to feel welcome if you're just pushing certain situations under the rug and not fixing it. Right, thank you. Okay, well, thank you all again so much. Those, those were our key questions that we wanted to respond to as panelists. And um, I want to open it up if, if any of you have any final thoughts you want to share, but also give folks a heads up um, if you're a student on the line and want to also share your experience. Yeah, I see your hands raising, so we will get to you next, uh, but be thinking about if you want to share. But panelists, is there anything else you would like to say um, for some final thoughts to share? 
I would just like to personally thank um, Jess from DSHA. She has been wonderful in getting the word out and just open to the conversation. And I would want more students like her um, to be involved in these conversations. Um, I also wanna, again, thank Ms. Wissing for also being so incredibly um, supportive and um, getting the word out to the staff. And these are individuals that I believe um, others should model after and uh, we need more of. And so I also wanna thank everyone else on um, this panel discussion because it means so much to us to have, uh, to see the support that we have. Yeah, I'd also like to really thank specifically Mr. Howard Corrin. He have seen him in every single one of my BSU meetings. So I'm really thankful that you're here. And Mr. Johnson, I've seen you pop in a couple. So thank you as well for coming here. And just thank you to everybody because I, I know this is not something that is required or within your school day. And it does really mean a lot to have a lot of these teachers and staff members here. So is to educate yourself about different things that are going on within like in the world. Um, also another big thing is really listening to students of color. Like when you are around people, just sit and listen to really understand how they are feeling and why they're feeling that way. And don't be afraid to ask questions, you know, well, why you feel this way or what is ways that I can do to help or things like that. Um, and another big thing is speak up in your social circle. You know, if you are seeing somebody that's doing something wrong, don't push it off and just be like, well, okay, I'm not going to say anything because if I was a certain person, I would reevaluate the people I'm hanging around and if they are the right people to hang around. And also get comfortable with being uncomfortable because while I do understand these are hard things to talk about, but it's not gonna go away in life. This is something that's going to go on when you go to college and even when you are out, when you're an adult. Um, also, another thing is learn from your mistakes. We all aren't perfect and we all might mess up, but you know, think about what you have done and try to learn from it. And, you know, if you need, ask for help from students of color. Um, and also kind of like engage in different conversations like these, or just show up to different events that your friends tell you about or things you care about on the internet just to show that, you know, you are there and you are ready and here to listen you want to make things better in society. Yeah, so how to be aware of racism and discrimination as a white person? Uh, it's pretty obvious um, when racism occurs, especially like outright racism, like saying the N-word or whatever. I feel like um, definitely teachers have to, at the beginning of their school year, say that this is a space where they will not condone racism and to make sure to tell um, their students that they are, are a person that they can go to when a racist incident happens because kids are sneaky and <laughs> they um, can go under the radar many times and, um, and, and it's, something that we we have to feel comfortable coming to teachers to tell um, these incidents. Um, and then with teachers, just always um, continue to learn, continue to be in these kinds of spaces to learn from students and how to um, become a better ally um, and to um, just continue to educate yourself on it because um, it is, hard dealing with racism on a daily basis for us and um, kind of adding that 
um, extra factor of trying to teach our white counterparts um, it's, it's exhausting. So a lot of that learning, we want you guys to take on yourself. Um, and just overall being open-minded um, when you, um, when a student or a, a individual comes up to you and says, hey, this, this was offensive and this is considered racist because as a white person, you cannot define racism and you cannot define what, um, what is offensive, um, especially when it comes to being a BIPOC student. Those additional points from students and the questions. Um, Asia, I know we have one question in the chat. Would you be willing to read that for us and open it up for our panelists to respond? Yeah, so the question is, um, this can be for any student to answer, but have you guys noticed any aspect of curriculum, coursework, or expectations that have not been culturally appropriate? Um, kind of going to, oh, Bailey, do you want to go first? I was just going to say, like, when we talk about, like, slavery, I feel like it's um, very, like, dumbed down like it's like it's just kind of made to seem as something that is not as bad as it really is and I've just noticed that like doing my own research and educating myself outside of the school curriculum like you would learn that it was like much more heinous and like violent um and I know a lot of the times like in history classes we don't always use the history book just because sometimes they're so inaccurate but that was just one specific thing that I noticed and it would shock me we don't learn actual facts because it seems like completely insane and like not possible but it actually is and so just like the very small units that we have every year about things regarding like people of color are like very condensed and they're kind of just all pushed into one unit and it doesn't really do justice to every actual struggle that is going on and we never really talk about the after effects of those things we kind of talk about slavery and then say racism comes after it but you never really hear about the layers to it how the generation after that faced police brutality the generation after that faced police brutality like it's key it keeps going on and so it kind of stops at a point and we don't talk about contemporary history that is affecting people today because it seems like it's kind of a non-issue to people when it doesn't affect them in their daily life Uh, so kind of there's there's no uh, history on indigenous people I've noticed um, in history classes um, um, and also with uh, Whitefish Bay they've created a whole different like class that's an elective and um, and we we need this kind of the black history it's I don't know what it's called but I'm pretty sure it's black history um, but I just, what doesn't make sense to me is why can't we just not whitewash um, America's history? And why can't we just, because if you have it as an elective, the chances of white students um, picking that class, um, if it isn't already involved in their own history class, that's really, really low. And um, of course, BIPOC students are willing to learn um, that history. Um, um, but it, we, white students are, aren't going to be as willing and might be reluctant or even just not even consider that class as a choice to them. 